So Casey, tell us, you're kind of a big deal. I, that's all I have to say. You're kind oh, of a big deal. Thank you. Princeton, Berkeley, um, several video games, and now Lunacy. Um, tell us who you are and uh, how this journey all began for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my name's Casey. I was a composer for, let's see, like eight years. Worked a lot in TV and film, video games. Uh, and then over time, became more and more interested in the music tech space. So I founded Lunacy back in 2019. It's been a while, actually. It's like five years. Um, and uh, yeah, so I still balance my time between writing for shows, making new plugins, making sounds, all the good stuff. So you haven't let that world go. You haven't let the film scoring world behind you. Not Still yet. Going on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this was, th this is the, the toughest thing. I think for a lot of people, when you're in this space, once you're fully in it, there's so many different opportunities and avenues you can take mm -hmm. with where you choose to focus your time. So like, if you want to be all in on video games, you can be, but like, it's just as fun to score a TV show or a, a film. Mm -hmm. um, so finding the balance has, has been tricky. And I think over time, I began to realize that making music tech with lunacy became like the ultimate dream for me um because it's still so creative you know we're still uh making sounds and and working with artists and um there's a there's a very heavy creative aspect to it but at the same time you still get to work the technical brain a bit which is good you get the balance there yeah so uh yeah it's been tough though to try to figure out how to keep writing while running the company because I, I work from the studio. I just treated it with acoustic paneling. Mm -hmm. And then I like don't write music until like 30 days later after <laughs> I've done all this. So yeah, it's, it's interesting for sure. Wow. Did you ever think, I mean, back in the day when you were, you know, going to Princeton, did you ever think like one day I'm going to own an audio company? That's going to be my aspirations and goals and dreams in the future. Uh, let me think. Did I, did I envision that for myself? I, I've always wanted to be a film composer first and yeah. foremost. Okay. I think since I was like seven. Really? I, uh, I was playing like Legend of Zelda or something, mm -hmm. um, and was so obsessed with the score that I would just like stop playing the game and start trying to figure out the melodies on the piano. Yep. Song of Storms, and, dude. Oh my oh, God. Oh yeah. The best. Jesus. The best. <laughs> um, so I... I think I knew from a young age, it's like, oh, I want to work in video games or some sort of cinematic universe because it's such a flexible world where mm -hmm. you get to like blend genres really intuitively. Um, and you don't really get that sort of flexibility with pop music or or some other industries. Um, with With movies and games, you can kind of do whatever you want. So there's like a lot of opportunity to genre bend which is what we try to do at Lunacy as well with the sounds and, and plugins that we make. But um, I, I've known from a young age that I wanted to do film composing and I guess didn't really realize until the very end of college that the tech component was just as important to me mm -hmm. um, in trying to achieve like a new sound or a new way to like create music. And that's uh, gradually become an even like bigger fascination for me. It's like, how do we, how do we actually transform the way people interact with music and the way people create film scores and, and whatnot? Wow. So uh, tell us, how did, how did you come up with the name lunacy? Is that, <laughs> you know, people, that like sort ask, of a... yeah, people ask me this all the time because, yeah. uh, like the, the natural assumption is like, oh, it's just, it just means crazy. Right. Like, right. People are like, oh, lunatic, lunacy. But um, the origination is from the, the word lunar, Luna. like moon, because mm -hmm. I've always loved moons, mm -hmm. celestial stuff. Right. I like the mystery, the magic of like lunar space. Yes. So um, really it's like a combination of those two things. Like we're trying to do something wild and abstract and um, otherworldly and celestial at the same mm -hmm. time. So, ah, yeah. I see. Okay. A little hidden time. gem. Okay, I like no. that. <laughs> Probably found it on a full moon. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Now's the time. Some, some moon cycle, I mean, it had to be. Well, that's really cool. I mean, because, you know, when I when I think about someone who's aspiring to go to Princeton or something, I'm like, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they don't they seem like a musical, you know, 
avenue to go down. But you you always had that in mind. Like eventually, I want to mu- work in music. I want to work in film. Um, and then you went to Berkeley. So what was that experience like? Yeah. Well, I started Princeton as a math major, which is hilarious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I was so like I didn't even realize how bad I was at math until I got there. And right. very, you know, I very quickly <laughs> realized I was like the dumbest in the room, and I was like, oh shit. All right. Um, <laughs> Had to pivot a little bit, but I I knew I wanted to do music and study music. I'm very glad I did, um, mm-hmm. and I minored in computer science, so I still had the balance of the music and tech. Yeah. Uh, but it's you know Princeton, it's it's an awesome school. It's not like when I was there, they were still sort of building out the arts program. Mm-hmm. It was very fresh. It wasn't like a funnel into Hollywood or film scoring. And so, what year was Berk- this? This was, uh, let's say, I graduated 2015. Mm, um, okay. So Berkeley was sort of the natural evolution, and they have that amazing um, campus in Valencia, yeah. Spain. Mm. So I was there for 11 months. That was like one of the best experiences of my life. Wouldn't wow. trade it for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, weather's very similar to L.A., actually. So it was a nice transition to L.A. from, from Berkeley. But um, Berkeley... I think taught me all of the practical skills I needed to know to actually write film music quickly in like a reasonable amount of time. Um, not nearly as academic, but like very practical and useful mm-hmm. in in their approach, which I loved. It's like exactly what you needed to know to leave and then go get an assistantship or mentor um, in in Los Angeles. All right. Wow. Everybody says Berkeley is amazing. I have a lot of friends and they're, you know, I went to Berkeley, I went to Berkeley and I'm kind of curious because I went to an audio school, not Berkeley, unfortunately, and everyone just smiles like, yeah, the curriculum we, that we taught, uh, we were taught this, we were taught that. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like I kind of feel blindsided. I'm like, I should have gone to Berkeley, man. That, that school seems so cool. Mm-hmm. They, they're, yeah, it's really solid. I think for certain things, especially like film composing, they just have a whole system for how they teach Mm-hmm. Uh, like which DAWs to use and how you set up templates and how you work with sample libraries. Right. Um, even like orchestration. Like I was a terrible orchestrator before Berkeley. And then we would have like classes where uh, a solo like flutist or a solo French horn player would come in for a full three hours and just like play our pieces and work with us. That's so you cool. like learned wow. every single instrument um, very intimately, which was mm-hmm. amazing. And so like, when we went to build something like Cube, um, we would sample all of those instruments, and I actually was so grateful to feel comfortable with how they work and um, you know where their sweet spots are, and like how we would get interesting samples from them because of all of the like orchestration tra- training. Mm-hmm. Um, so super useful. I'm very grateful for that experience, and it was only like eleven months. You know, some people do like three-year grad programs, and it's like, oh. Yeah, that's crazy. So you you went through a whole grad program in 11 months, and you weren't even in Boston. You were in Spain. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's kind of awesome. Yeah. So um, they they cram it all into 11 months. So you're working, like, every day Mm -hmm. for the 11 months. But then you leave, and you have a master's degree. You can teach. You can do whatever you want. And and you kind of have all of the knowledge you need to start a career in – film or video game or TV mm-hmm. music. <clears throat> so wow. highly recommend. Really, That's really awesome. great. Now to someone who's uninitiated in like film composing and video game composing, how would you describe your style? Like, are you just a straight orchestral composer mm. or do you have your own specific flavor? Cause you know, both John and I make music, but it's completely different styles, but I'm just curious about how you go about it. Yeah. So one of my co-founders, Max, um, co-founder of Lunacy, Mm -hmm. uh, writes all of the trailer music for our products with me. Yeah. Um, So if you want to hear my style, it's a lot of it's in the trailers that we release. Uh, We do all of our own music for the trailers. Good spot. Yeah. All right. Uh, It's really important to us to like have our own sort of sonic fingerprint on all of the things that we release. Mm-hmm. because it's like our brand and it's the, you know, it, it, if, if we're releasing sound packs, it should sound like us. For sure. um, but he likes to describe my style as rainbow sprinkles, which is like, <laughs> Interesting. This, I, I'm just like very twinkly. I like love celestes. I love like reverse harp. I'm, I'm like really into very quirky, stylized, um, colorful um, genre stuff. Um, I recently learned the term botanica. I don't know if you all have heard that of that <laughs> style of music. 
I mean, uh, I know what it is, but it you is. should explain it to Chris yeah. just in case. Oh, he God, know. I don't even know if I'm qualified <laughs> to explain it because I literally just discovered this like a week ago. But um, there's like a subgenre of this sort of hybrid organic electronic music called botanica. Um, I think a lot of Japanese producers produce this genre. It's really, really cool. Um, and it's so playful and quirky and like uh, somehow it remains organic even though it's like all synthesized and and they're using noise from microphones and stuff to create texture. It's it's just really wow. It's really well check done. Check that out. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> we learn wow. something new every day. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm striving go. I'm striving for Botanica. I guess that's like my my peak style is what I would love to do. Well, but I, that, I've also done orchestral yeah. stuff and you right. know action stuff. Right. So. Well, that actually tracks because when I when I've gone through all of the presets that have your name on it, Casey Culp's presets mm-hmm. in the, either Cube or Beam, it, it has that vibe to it. You know what I'm saying? It's a little bit light, a little bit like kind of out there. It's got a lot of high end, you know, like information on it. It's really cool. So, being that I know 100%. that about you now, um, I'll have to go yeah. and revisit those. Yeah. Wow. Totally. Totally. That's awesome. So, tell us about how Lunacy came about. Like, you know, it was just you. You finished. You were working in film, and then did you have like an idea for like your dream like instrument, and that's how the company came together, or was it more like just kind of random and, and just sort of happened? So there was a very specific moment um, where I was working on this TV show Supernatural. I don't know if you all have heard of Supernatural. Oh, yeah. I love that show, Sammy. Um, Sammy, yeah, <laughs> so good, dude. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it went on for I think like eighteen or nineteen seasons. It was like one of CW's most popular shows for a while. It was yeah. like so popular. It is a good show. Um, Cult followed. Lots Mm -hmm. and lots of fans. Um, So my first job in L.A. was assisting a composer who was working on that show. And then eventually I was more involved and and helping with the writing process. And after working on uh, like five or six seasons of it, you would start to score the same kind of horror scene over and over and over again. And be like, Mm. okay, how do I score this eight-minute ambient horror scene um quickly oh, so that's have- what you were doing on there so the, so okay so i've been hearing your work and not even not even known about it <laughs> well it's a collaborate i i can't take too much credit but yeah i was yeah. i was working on that show for a long time maybe like four years and uh and i realized that um there had to be a way to automate this process of like building these sort of drone soundscapes that evolve where like you're not cheating by holding a button down and having it do the work. But like, I needed a way to do it quickly because TV Mm -hmm. schedules are so fast. And I'm sure you know this, John. Um, You might have like a day to do eight minutes of music or something ridiculous because- It's a lot of time, actually. Whole day, shit. (laughs) I know, I know. (laughs) So you have to to work really quickly and smartly. And uh, a lot of the ways composers do that is through sample libraries that have pre-baked patches in them that will- do a lot of the heavy lifting and then they can sort of just dial in the right settings. Um, but that was always a little unsatisfying and, and slow for me because you'd find a patch that you'd love, but then at the same time, it's like, ah, I know like a thousand other composers have already used this Omnisphere patch. I got to be careful. Yeah. Like we don't want it to sound too <laughs> um, cliche. Uh, like there's this, uh, there's this shark tank, um, patch that uh, is, is used on the Shark Tank theme that mm-hmm. I think I've heard at least like 20 different times on other TV shows. Oh my so God, you have to be hilarious. careful, right? Like people There's have a cat used... sample out there that I feel like I've heard on like every movie from like the late <laughs> oh, 90s to like 2000s or something. Like, like, oh, there it is again. It's like, yes, yeah, so I kind of get what you mean on that sense. Yeah. So it's tricky because you, you want to be careful. Like you want to have your own style. You want to make sure the sounds you're making are unique but you have to work super fast and there's just not enough time to like build your own stuff and record your own libraries. Um, so I was trying to find a solution for that. And for a while I was like combining different contact libraries, trying to find, find ways to automate the process Mm -hmm. so that I could basically just hold down a button and it would blend between different libraries. Um, and that was sort of working. I, I think there was this really cool library called Thrill by uh, Galaxy Instruments. I don't know if you've all mm. heard heard of that, but they had this beautiful sort of aleatoric um, effects engine that could blend things 
in uh, this like XY pad, and I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and I started using my uh, Leap Motion, which is this this like hand sensor to control right. the XY pad to mm-hmm. oh, uh, blend these sounds. Yeah. And so I would like literally score the scene in real time. I would just let the scene play and then sort of wave my hand around. Wow, to, like the theremin's gone full like circle. Like a hundred percent. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. <laughs> so um, I was doing that for a while and I was like, well, this is silly because I'm only using two of the three dimensions of this right. hand sensor. <laughs> Jesus mm-hmm. Christ, dude. Holy you know? Yeah. And yeah. it was like, uh, oh, wait, why not just use all three? You know, why, like, not? why yeah. not just like go the extra mile and, and make eight samplers all in one? And so that's when I started like designing Cube. I was like, okay, well, I know I can sample things. I'd already built some of my own contact libraries for composers before as like, you know, just custom like proprietary projects for them. And so um, I got a group of friends together to start helping me design and build something that would allow me to automate this, this film scoring process originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took like, I think uh, it took like two years to build cube completely. Um, And it started very specific. Like the goal, the intention originally was really just to solve this one film scoring problem. But then as we were making it, it was like, oh, actually we can solve a lot of things this way. We can make really unique pulses. We can make really interesting like one shot textures and keys patches uh, if if we like design this correctly. And so it, it quickly evolved into something that was a lot bigger than this sort of horror ambient music tool Mm -hmm. um and so we started recording lots of different instruments and trying to fit it into a more pop production context a more ambient genre context um and then found that it was really working and the concept was versatile enough to support um all of these different genres and production types so that that was really the the genesis of of Cube. That is crazy. Yeah, That's I mean, how could you hand. not love an instrument oh like Cube? You know, it's an eight sided <laughs> sampler with you know interaction between all the different samples. And when you approached me about it, I was like, uh, okay, let's check this out. And I was just immediately like drawn in, you know, because it's oh, so much great. fun to Thank just you. morph those things. And you're right. I mean, when you're producing on a time limit, you have a very specific like window. And the stuff, it can't be repeated. You can't just like, oh, yeah, that's the same preset that I used on my last track. That's the same. You know what I'm saying? Like, it has to be original sounds. You have to create something out of nothing, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then have it be, you know, fit the vibe and fit the mood and all that stuff. I mean, that's just, that's wild. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we also quickly realized that, like, most people aren't going to have those leap motion hand sensors of course available God, I want one of those so bad dude now yeah. that you mentioned that holy crap they're cool like <laughs> they're does that really feel cool. powerful when you just have it in your hand and you're just like orchestrating music just with oh your you're hands? a total like, wizard yeah that's it's, it's, it's wizardry yeah it's really really fun um but they're like expensive and hard to find and like they're not actually meant for like vsts you know like mm-hmm. there there are apps that let you connect midi to them so you can translate the data into MIDI data and then use it with a plugin. But the setup's kind of challenging. And so we realized pretty early on, we can't depend on people having some external devices to control this thing. It's going to be a pain in the ass. Like we want people to be able to play a chord and it just does its thing organically. Um, And so that's when we came up with the concept for orbits where you have this like sort of preset motion within mm-hmm. the space that is either random or tempo synced or whatever you choose so that um, all of the extra work of needing to decide where the sounds are moving is is done for you as well, but it's highly customizable so you're not sort of locked into a single pattern. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crazy concept. Yeah, because you can use the same orbit and just completely randomize the samples and get a totally different result. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's really and cool. and the randomization was really important too because we we wanted to make sure people could take a preset and then just in a single button click like transform the whole thing into something that was unique and new and where they could sort of uh, really lean into the happy accidents that come with with using a randomized button. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like in most plugins, 
people are afraid of clicking the random button because it usually yields some pretty wild, unusable <laughs> results. <And> so, <laughs> never know what you're going to get. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah, my hydrosense yeah. says hello, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. <laughs> 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 yeah, wow. Um so so after after Cube, it was like okay, we've got something here and then you started growing your team. Like you started adding people on and then bringing people into the business and things started to take off from there. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 funny how quickly your life switches to like spreadsheet mode versus like creative mode when you're mm-hmm. building out the business. Yeah. Um and I still try to maintain at least a couple hours a day where I'm like sound designing or doing something creative so I'm not just like crunching yeah. numbers or like paying invoices or salaries or whatever you know it mm-hmm. it becomes a, a funny balance because uh, you want to grow and you want to do it organically and sustainably but you don't want to lose like the magic of designing your own stuff and having your fingerprint on on things because um, that's what's really important to us mm-hmm. we don't want to ever like lose our own taste in sound design. Um, I think it's like part of what made the initial cube launch special for us is like we spent so long just designing the sounds with us, no outside creators mm-hmm. involved. And so um, we want to maintain that sort of sound quality and taste as long as we can, um, which is hard to do because once you start expanding and working with other people, you really have to like dial in how they're going to work on things and how they're going to design things for the product. Um, but we've been very lucky. Like we, we worked with Venus Theory, we worked with Ben Jordan on some stuff. Um, they're both amazing, so so easy to work with, and mm-hmm. uh, really did did some sound design that we wouldn't have been able to do ourselves, which was cool. Mm-hmm. And I think that has been one of the most rewarding things is to see people use it or to design sounds for it in ways that we couldn't have predicted or imagined. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's got to be crazy of, too, huh? Yeah, yeah it gets, it, it sort of like goes beyond your control in a, in a really beautiful way um, where it's just this ecosystem that people are exploring and trying to figure out um, uh, like on their own and and creating their own ways of, of using it for, for their tracks, so. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, okay, so that, let's fast forward a little bit. So we had... Cube was launched, you started the business, and now here we are in, <clears throat> excuse me, 2024, and we have Beam. And Beam is sort of the brainchild of like uh, several, uh, I don't know, is it the evolution of Cube? Is it the natural companion piece? Is it like the companion mm-hmm. <laughs> album or plug-in, so to say? It's a good question. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, Beam was Beam was a hard plug-in to do. Wow. Mm-hmm. It was really, really hard. Um and uh, fortunately, I didn't touch a, a single line of code on it, which is great. Uh, <laughs> we have we have people way smarter than me working on um, the algorithms now, so that's all good. Um, and and they're so talented. We we've got such a great team of developers who are figuring out like new ways to do granular processing and convolution and all of that. So um, it's it's been really really exciting. Yeah. But so, where are the origins hard. of Beam? Like, where did the, where did the first pencil get drafted? How did the yeah. how did the, what's the genesis of it? Well, we knew we wanted to do an interactive effects plugin because mm-hmm. it was like, okay, you've done the instrument, now you got to do something that's effects. Um, mm-hmm. And and so we were really excited to figure out how to make an even more interactive version of Cube, and I think we got there. Um, it it took a really long time, but designing the UI, we wanted to like basically find a way to completely remove knobs from the interface, mm-hmm. which, uh, ha- to my <laughs> surprise, so far has been a little bit controversial. Like I've I've been reading some of the comments that people have been saying on yeah. on YouTube, and because you, we just we want to make sure we're aware of like how people are really perceiving it, right. um, and I think people see the interface and they're like, oh there can't be that much going on under the hood if there's this much animation and like I- interface design happening on the front end. Um, which is funny because we spent like 90% of the time on all of the back end DSP and then like 10% making it really usable and beautiful and fun to play with on the front end. Um, so there were like some design choices we made that I, I feel really confident about about removing knobs and making things more abstract, making things more playful. Um, but in general, we, we knew we wanted to make some ecosystem 
that could evolve over time was really fun to play with, really flexible, and maintained the same sort of design philosophy as Cube, where you've got a lot of control under the hood, but on the surface, you've got a really beautiful uh, like toy to play with that's just as powerful as other plugins, but um, is not like spamming your eyes with with knobs and sliders. You know, mm-hmm. there's something a little uh, more inviting about like an abstract approach to the interface design. Um, um. So I, I would consider it, yeah, like the evolution of Cube, sort of. Uh, it's obviously very different, and it was designed to pair with Cube. Like, as we were testing and making the presets, it was always a matter of, like, trying different Cube presets with the Beam presets to see mm-hmm. if oh, cool. something would stick. Um, so it was very much designed as a companion effect. Uh, but it stands on its own. Like, I think you can definitely use it with without Cube, and um, you can use Cube without Beam, but... We wanted to maintain that same design philosophy of keeping things really abstract and also push it a little further. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's it's even more abstract than Cube. Like you really only see like one or two knobs when you open up the interface, and everything else is a this sort of tactile looking object that you can you can play with. It kind of reminds me a lot of of macros in a certain way. Where, like for example, like if I program something on pigments, there's there's four macros, right? Mm-hmm. So like you think, oh, there's just four knobs, but it's like there's a lot of thought and a lot of time spent adding the stuff that controls the ma- or the, the controls mm-hmm. that the macro then moves, yeah. right? So it could be like 10 different destinations at different depths. Some could be bipolar, or some could be unipolar. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, yeah. it's one knob, but there's a lot going on behind that. So it kind of makes me think of that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. And, and we wanted it to be curated in the same way as Cube. So like... Uh, you know, it's very tweakable. You can you can do lots of stuff by opening up each node and editing each effect. But in the same way as Cube, you can really just load a preset and there's already so much complexity baked in so that you can work quickly. Like I'm a I'm guilty of preset surfing. I love surfing <laughs> presets. It's great. They're there for a reason. People yeah. who are much better at sound design than I am design them and and we should use them. We should absolutely use them and be aware of like how you're using them and how you can alter them to to make them your own. But we're really keen on making presets like amazing. So like for Beam, we commissioned many hundreds of presets and we only kept like the top 250. So we actually had hundreds more that we didn't even include. Wow. Because <clears throat> they just didn't meet the cut. They didn't make the cut. Of, mm-hmm. of what we thought was like a usable or like valuable um, complex preset or simple preset. Uh, so it's really a very curated set of, of things. Yeah, we had uh, Alchemy on the show about five episodes ago. I saw. Yeah, he's and awesome. And his was some of my favorite presets in he's that He's so talented. Whole, oh, my God. It was so yeah. good. Like a lot of, in, in my video especially, I was like, yeah, check this out. And I was just showing <laughs> his presets off like, yo, this yeah, this is my boy. And he's uh, he's doing some really good work. He's so um, yeah, he's so talented. I was I was so happy we got to work with him. Um yeah. and I think we're gonna we're gonna do some more presets with him soon, actually. Oh, that's great. So that's great. yeah, we're we're gonna release like a uh one point one update with new mm-hmm. presets and oh, great. and features and stuff. So we're trying to keep yeah. this ship moving. To me, it really like when I first, you know, got my came to grips with it, it reminded me of a plugin from the future. You know what I'm saying? Because cool. even though we mm. don't have you know, all like you said, all the knobs and all the traditional things on a plug on plugin. It was like, what is this, and where where are we going with this whole plugin business? Where are we going mm-hmm. with this whole music production business, right? Because I can imagine a future in like 10, 15 years, we're we're not going to need leap motions. We're all going to be sitting there with our Vision Pros or something, 100%. And we're gonna be moving our hands around. You know what I'm saying? And a hundred percent pulling yeah. nodes, making little you know connections between things with a, with our physical bodies. You yes. know, and then eventually it'll probably be our with our mind. But I mean, the, you know what I'm saying? Like th- that was a glimpse into the future of what it could be because oh, yeah. it doesn't need to have, be a straight two dimensional with like, you know, a 3D simulated interface of a, <laughs> a, of a traditional yeah. mixing. You know, it doesn't need to be right. like that. You know what right. I'm saying? It can be abstract. It can have you. It can beg you to sort of like start clicking on things and seeing how far it can go. Totally. Yeah? So totally. those who don't understand it were like. They were probably just set off by the fact that it was just a bunch of like orbs and uh, flashy animations. But once you start clicking under the hood, it's like, oh my god! Like, look at all this. Yeah, it's all totally. underneath. 
the surface. You know, so you don't need a billion knobs for a plugin to be good. You know what I mean? Because yeah. a lot of the times, like the, then the person using it is going to have to learn all these knobs, how they work all together. When someone who's designed it or much more intelligent can put these together and say, "This is probably what you need." If you're mm-hmm. going to eat some food. People aren't like, oh, here's the lettuce, here's the tomato, here's this, here's that. Now put it all together. You're like, I just want a burger, dude. That's, that's, <laughs> I just, it's like, it reminds me of uh, Valhalla Vintage Verb, right? For reverbs, mm. you can do so many controls if you wanted to, but that one, there's only a few on there. And it's, it's, it's yeah. all I need. It's all I need. So I it's use like, that verb so much. That yeah. is, you know what I mean? I think it's I it's amazing. <laughs> like on every single track, all the yeah. time. Right. Dude, have I've, you got some wave Casey, I've got thing? some presets for you. If you need more presets, I got oh, some yeah. presets for you that'll freaking Yes, he does. <laughs> he's my, does. Partner, my partner made them and he'll it'll blow your mind, dude. He's, wow. he's a wizard. Yeah. Amazing. Just send a <laughs> yeah. sine wave through it. I say this all the time. Send a sine wave through it and just close your <laughs> eyes and just listen to the reverb. It's amazing. Well, yeah. going back, going back to design, you know, because really like I'm not I'm not dogging the synthesizer, but one example of something that is kind of intimidating when you look at it is Surge XT. Like mm, there's yeah. a, there's, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. When you look yeah. at that synthesizer, even though it's free and it's built by this wonderful community, the interface is almost like to beginners who are looking at that synthesizer, it can be like really intimidating. So it's almost like with Beam and with Cube, like the simplicity of it is what draws you in. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. there's not as much here. I don't feel overwhelmed. I, I kind of know where things are and then I can work, you know, from there and just get a good sound right away. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And we wanted to provide like the best of both worlds where, I mean, there are still a ton of knobs in Beam. Like Mm, if you max out the nodes, I think there are probably like 150 or 200 knobs (laughs) in there. (laughs) It's like a lot, right? (laughs) Right. But but you're not like bombarded with them. They are sort of tucked away intuitively Mm -hmm. so that you're not like dealing with them unless you have to. Right. Um, and that I, I think that's important because I've seen how a lot of producers work, um, and most of them are not sound designers. Like most mm-hmm. of them are trying to make music, and they have really good musical taste. They really know what they're doing um, harmonically, melodically. Mm-hmm. They just want to find a sound mm-hmm. that makes sense for whatever they're doing. Yeah. They they don't want to be bogged down with the technical aspect of whatever interface they're using. Mm-hmm. Um, they just want to be inspired. They want something to actually solve some sound trick that they need for a certain moment. Yeah. Um, and and so it's important for us to make that as seamless as possible for them where the presets all are designed for specifically that and um, they don't need to like touch any knobs to get there. It's like really straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you want to make sure that it's it's usable for the sound designers who need to to actually change the knobs and the, the mm-hmm. parameters to make it sound good. Um, so it's it's a balance of of making sure everything's there, but uh, tucked away in, in a intuitive way. Right. Wow. I want to I want to talk about something that I just sort of touched upon. I mean, where do you see is some coming from someone who designs plugins? Um, you know how the architecture works. Where do you see music production in, say, five or ten years? Like, do you see this staying the same way that it is now, where we're using the tools we're traditionally doing, or do you see it evolving into something much greater, or even I don't know, much more automated? Yeah, this sounds like it could turn into an AI conversation, which I'm all about. <laughs> <laughs> this this um, show is called Harmonic Horizon, so we're looking out into the future, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, oh, that's such a good question. Uh, I'd, I'd be like lying if I said I had any idea of like where it's really going to be in five years. I I have my own opinions about where it should go. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean with, with generative music or sounds in particular, I think that's going to be a really large part of our lives in about five years. Mm -hmm. And I hope, and and this is going to be our approach to it as we sort of delve into this territory, um, that those tools augment our creativity and don't replace them. Yeah. So, you know, we're working with tools of AI or machine learning that are really allowing us to work faster and smarter um, and keep doing all the fun parts that we love about putting mm-hmm. music together, um, but just make things easier and faster. Yeah. And this is, it's a delicate conversation because like we're already starting to see so many companies put out software that feels like it's going to replace rather than augment 
mm-hmm. our um, capabilities. And uh, I think realistically, well, there are a few things. So one, I, I think the way we interact with sound will change. I think it has to. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, the audio waveform has looked the same for like 30 years or whatever. <laughs> it's just, you know, time and amplitude. That's it. That's it. And you and you think about that and you think about how crazy that is because like there's so much more information in a wave file or an, an audio uh, file yeah. that can be shown visually. All the partials, all the phase of all those exactly. partials. Yeah, yeah. Even things like timbre or character, which gets a little more subjective um, sometimes, but you could choose how you want to represent audio visually and mm-hmm. no one has done that yet um it's it's really wild to me that like every daw works really well but it they all do the exact same thing in the exact same way like they display audio waveforms the same way they um everything's very linear mm-hmm. on a time based scale yeah. and so what i would like to see is a shift from sort of that more traditional paradigm of how audio looks into something that's a lot more interactive and visually informative. So when you, like, let's say you were looking through Splice at a bunch of sounds trying to find the right kick drum, it's impossible without listening to all hundred of them, right? Because mm-hmm. they all look exactly the same. Um, <laughs> right, yeah. it's, it's like a mess. It's like they all just are this fading transient. Uh, and it's like I have no idea what that sounds like until I've actually clicked on it and listened to it. Um, which feels so wrong because we know we can display these things in so many different ways. What if you were able to explore sound and work with sound in a way that was uh, much more intuitive, where you actually saw how something sounded before you even heard it? And so with Beam, that was like, this was sort of wow. our first attempt at it's that. mind blowing. <laughs> this was our first attempt at that because, like, with the space node in Beam, that's a convolution engine. And as we were making all of the impulses, we realized, oh, all of the impulses look exactly the same. The waveforms are, they look like kick drums, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's just this this transient hit with a tail, with a fade. And, and it's just not useful. Like, you can tab through impulses, and you have no idea what that space sounds like until you've run something through it and tried it. And it feels like such a huge waste of time to have to do that just to test something. So... Mm-hmm. With Beam, like th- this was our first trial, I, I guess you could call it, at trying to come up with a way to display impulse responses visually. So we came up with like seven or eight categories for the node. Right. And mm-hmm. depending on the category, it's going to change the way the node looks. And so like at a glance, you at least have some like idea of what it's going to do to your sound without even needing to hear it. Um, right. And it's not perfect. There's like so much more you could do to display an impulse visually, and and we're going to keep adding new ways to do that. But I think it's really helpful to be able to just look at um, a sound or an impulse and and see what it's going to sound like before you hear it. That is a crazy concept to think about. <laughs> and even like I'm like when you say that, I keep thinking in my mind looking at it on a spectrum view. But then again, you're like. Well, what if we went even further than the spectrum view? Because sound happens in 3D space, right? And we always view it on a 2D surface. Mm-hmm. So it kind of makes you think, how would you envision that at a 3D? I don't know. I'm just kind of going on a tangent because you said that, but that's super interesting. Yeah, so I think, I think this is where Vision Pro is really interesting, where um, AR, VR, mixed reality, I think they call it, goggles are going to be really important for the way we like interact with music. And I'm sure there's going to be like a big race if there isn't already to sort of take over that space and design hopefully something new uh, for that ecosystem where you can play with sound in a way that's like interactive 3d visual, you know um, I I think, I, I think that's definitely the next five years, like the future of the next five years. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping it's more than just something like a, <clears throat> like an interactive game or something that you play with audio. Like, yeah, I want it to be right. useful to the point where it's, it's almost production ready. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, we want like Ableton in Vision Pro. Yeah. <laughs> like we, that'd be crazy. It'd be so cool. Wow. Yeah. But I think it's going to require really reimagining the way we interact with audio because like it would be so lame if they just like 
put a screen with like flat waveforms. Oh yeah. On your Vision Pro goggles, you know, mm-hmm. it's like it's not the point. The point is something <laughs> right. so much more detailed and intricate. Like to be able to literally walk through your track in like a 3D space, you know, like if you could spread your um, able to track across a room and be able to like see where sounds fit in mm-hmm. in like a space rather than just on a 2D timeline, it could be so powerful and yeah. and really useful. Um, so I hope and think that's going to be the future. Not just visually, but I I once had an experience. Um, this was in 20, 2017 or 2018. And uh, John Luce from Dolby invited my partner Don and I up to Dolby Studios in San Francisco. Cool. And he had taken some of our existing tracks uh, in stereo and he had mixed them or remixed them in Dolby Atmos. And we were in the very Dolby theater, like the original Dolby theater, right? And he played our tracks for us. And it was like, literally, like you, you felt like the track was around you in every single dimension. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. From behind That's you, be the inside of you, to in front of you. And this is the stuff that we wrote, you know? And it was just mixed in these crazy, you know, I don't know how many points they have. It's probably on about over 360, but. Did you have to give oh them stems for that? What? <laughs> did you have to give him like bass stem? Uh, yeah, or just like gave a, a, we just gave him stereo stem. Oh, and wow, he did that's his impressive. thing, whatever algorithms that he was putting him through. Wow. Um, but the point is, is like not just visual, but we also have the spatial aspect of it. So like totally. what you were saying, walking through your track, it you know, we're, we're talking about audio with just the visual aspect, but then also the sound of it too. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there can be two, the two worlds can come together and we can have immersive audio, but it does not. It doesn't look like how it does now. A hundred percent. Yeah, and that's where I was going. Yeah. Yeah, I think Apple's onto something here with this too, because they they have the whole spatial audio thing, which mm-hmm. I don't think is quite there yet. Like I actually turn it off on my AirPods. I do too. Like, oh yeah. I kind of can't stand it yet, but I think <laughs> it's coming. Like it's gonna yeah, be I really don't, good. I don't think it is. I'm gonna be that outlier in this one. I oh, don't think. Really? I don't think it's gonna be a thing. No, because like, it's seen as how five one came out and. Some people get it, some people don't, and it's like, oh, mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of okay. And then everybody who has that most is like, okay, is this set up properly? If there's a problem, is it with your device? Is it with your speakers? And there's so many points of error that your average person that just wants to watch TV or listen to music probably won't really want to go through that whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But then again, I'm, I feel like I'm old. I'm like, stereo is the stereo's king. It's just all about stereo, left, right. <laughs> but then, you know. Yeah, maybe, I mean, stereo works really well. Like, it's definitely not a bad thing. Like, I think. Yeah. You can enjoy most music equally in stereo as you can in, in Atmos. So when, Atmos when you so cool. when you say you're turning it off, you mean on your AirPods, right? Your AirPod Pros. Yeah, yeah, because they have yeah. that setting. You can like right, exactly. It's very now. It's what if I think? But what if like I mean, you had multiple speakers around you? I'm sure spatial audio would have more of a purpose, right? Where right, your maybe your bass was behind you or underneath you. The high end was up somewhere, you know. I mean, that would be cool. But five yeah. degrees, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. That, yeah, so maybe it's our just our listening devices have not caught on to the technology yet. Totally, that could be the case. The yeah. video Ben Jordan made about that was pretty good. I don't know if you guys have seen that one where he does Mm-mm. like takes like half an hour long and he talks the whole thing about Atmos. And I was kind of curious. I was like kind of like on the fence about it. And I watched the video. I'm like, yeah, he's right, hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. He's, he's right. I feel like he's a smart I'll, I'll link dude. it down though. But yeah, all right, yeah. That'd be ben cool. is That'd like be cool. two or three years ahead of all of us. I, I, I'm convinced he sees into the future. He he's he, he's <laughs> he all probably knowing. does. Yeah, he probably well, does. <laughs> he is a Scorpio. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he, oh, he I lives, see. Uh, yeah, he, he's got that prophetic eye. You know what I'm that saying? that explains he's, it. He really does. Yeah. He's yeah. amazing. So um, so where do you see uh, this? Was, that was a great. I'm I'm so glad I asked the question because you're the kind of guy who I can see would lead this type of charge. You know what I'm saying? Like into the future we go, here we are. We're not just displaying waveforms anymore. We're talking about partials and phase and all this kind of stuff. Um, so where do you see not just, I mean, that was a great answer to that. Where do you see the future of lunacy going? And um, can you tell us anything about, you know, what's coming up next? Let's see. I, I have to be careful here not to give away too many secrets. <laughs> this is all what we're doing, guys. <laughs> Here's everything. Um, but what types of areas would you like to explore? That's what I'm asking. Oh, that yeah, totally. Um, well, for for Beam, we have like a whole roadmap, which I mm-hmm. think we've somewhat unveiled already. Which is we're going to mm-hmm. add lots of new uh, effect nodes, and, and we really we really want to make it this incredible ecosystem that evolves over time and becomes this this like really useful effect direct that has been curated it's not just a collection of effects mm-hmm. that has been slapped together it's like this ecosystem that's grown over time similar to what we 
did with Cube, where we've sort of fleshed out the palette with different kinds of instruments. We're mm-hmm. we're planning to do the same thing with Beam. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a lot of plans for that for the rest of this year and 2025 with new nodes. Um, that's great. Hopefully, every few months, that's our goal. I say that now, mm-hmm. but I'm way too optimistic about timelines. Things take so <laughs> much longer. Like we yeah. were supposed to release Beam in like September. And then really? like it was like, all right, now it's October, now it's November. It just it's so hard to to get things right and get them over the, mm. the finish line. Um but we, we have a really great team who's working on the the new stuff and it's it's gonna be it's gonna be really good. I'm very excited about that. Um mm. but we do have plans for like a big, big third product, which I can't reveal yet. Of course. Um mm-hmm. but we we wanna, you know, we wanna change the way people interact with samples um, mm. and the way samples are generated, I should say. Like the way, mm. um, I mean, w- w- with Cube, we we feel like we we really got there in, in letting people play with sound sources, multi-sampled things that we have made. You can drag in your own samples and that was a big step for us and we want to we wanna take it to like a whole other level. Um, mm-hmm. so that's, that's definitely in the pipeline. That's a big, big thing, um, we're developing. Uh, and I probably can't say too much more just yet, but, uh, mm-hmm. we really want to, you know, we want to stay focused on the things that we know we do really well. We want to keep providing people with samples and, and ways to interact with samples that are unique. I think there's something so beautiful about finding like the golden nuggets in samples when you record something like the way i sound design is literally just looking for like the outtakes or any small snippets of sound that actually kind of sound bad out of context but you can weave into something unique and noisy Mm. and organic that's like really my favorite thing so we want to keep going in that direction and finding ways to curate and generate those kinds of sounds um, and let people upload and play with their own sounds in an even more interactive way than Cube, in a, mm-hmm. in a way that's like really, really um, new and 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 interesting. Yeah. So hopefully wow. that it, it's a little it's a little too vague. I feel like I'm being a little vague, but that's, that's oh, no, no, I, vague I, I didn't, fine, I, I didn't fine. ask for specific. I, I knew it was going to be a vague answer, but hey, listen, Britannica, bro, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe five months down the road, you're like, thank uh, God I was vague because this whole thing shifted <laughs> like 180 degrees. Who knows? 100. Yeah. So maybe it totally it's a good could. thing. It totally um, could. Well, I, you know, this is a totally side rant, but have you ever? Um, I want to have him on the show, but have you ever played with or, or experienced? Um, Peter from Dawson, his his synthesizer Cult, spelled K U L T. You've seen it? Yeah, I haven't yeah. played with it, but I've I've seen it. Yeah, I, I want you to check it out because this is something that I, I imagine that Lunacy could venture into one day. Is his oscillator types are based on math, and then it's like this three D interactive kind of thing where each oscillator type isn't your traditional like sawtooth, sine wave, square wave. It's yeah. much more complicated than that. He also has a degree in mathematics. Um, and I think you'd really love his approach to synthesis. I can you know tell he's brilliant. Yeah, he's he, so brilliant, and I, yeah. I can't wait to have him on the show. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask him one of these days. Um, but yeah, like doing something like that, I would love to see um, a lunacy product that was actually, you know, um, virtual analog or virtual synthesis or something. Totally, like that. That'd be really cool. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in physical modeling too. Mm-hmm. I think that's been really popular recently. Yeah, um, that might be this, worth going. I mean, it's kind of yeah. cool. There's mm-hmm. so much you can do with physical modeling. Like, you know, even with machine learning, you can like create models out of other instruments. It's it's kind of the wild west. I, I'm pretty fascinated by mm-hmm. where that might take us and how we could use um, physical modeling in a way that doesn't just sound like, you know, like a guitar pluck, like the way it sounded forever. Um, but I think it's sort of it's, <laughs> yeah, it's getting FM there. Bells. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, we might we might explore that too at some point. Um, we've definitely got our hands full, so we're we're taking it one step at a time, and not yeah. trying to overwhelm ourselves. But mm-hmm. um, I've seen Dawson's since, and they look great. They sound great. He's he's onto something for sure. He's just so next level. Every every single product that he creates is different. It's unique. And, right. you know, it's just like, it's something like you never expected this to even be a thing. And he just like, he says like his daughters give him ideas. 
he draws it up on paper or whatever. And these things, he just creates it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's yeah. really amazing how he works. Yeah. It's is a he a, a one, he's a one stop shop. Is he, is he just, yeah. is it just him? It's just him. Wow. I mean, now he's hired like a social media team, I'm sure. And like had people managed it, but his, it just started with him, you know, having his theoretical, you know, like brain, PhD brain and just going at music technology, you know, wow. and figuring out new ways to express, you know, different things in that sound. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. It's, it's funny because like at the beginning of this, I, I was had this question for you and I feel like I, you've answered it not knowingly. So mm -hmm. I was initially okay. going to ask you, so if you're going to, if you're building plugins, you're building things that maybe people want to use, how on earth do you come up with an idea that actually first works for whatever you're doing and second of all, something that's new? Because I've gone in Reactor for a while. I've messed around with Juice a little bit. I've put together like choruses and bit, in Bitwig and the grid. I'm like, this is really cool. It's a very satisfying feeling for sure. But like, if I made this as a VST plugin, like who would, who would care? Like, you know? And mm -hmm. then I was like, how, how is that different for, for like Dawson or for you? And it makes me think that you guys ha initially had a big problem that you had to solve. And from that problem grew the solution. Then from that solution, you're kind of adding more things that you didn't know that was there until you crossed yeah. that timeline. So I'm like, maybe yeah. that's kind of the, the thing where futures go, the future is going with, with plugins, maybe. I don't know. Yes, mm -hmm. I, that's a great question. I mean, the, I mean, the key for us has always just been iteration. Like, we'll start, like we, we knew, originally Beam was supposed to be like just three convolution nodes. Like we we mm -hmm. had this concept of like, oh, well, we want to record really interesting spaces and textures because I find that really useful when I'm sound designing to like run something through an interesting impulse and mm -hmm. like to be able to blend between them fluidly, kind of the way Cube blends between sounds fluidly, sounds really useful. And so we were like, all right, well, that's let's do that. Sounds great. And then we started designing it. And we're like, oh, it's not enough. Like what if we added granular? And then we just kept going and going for 18 months until we hit a point where it was like, all right, I think, I think this is it. I think we have like the whole plugin. Um, but like even in the final month, we were still adding new features and stuff. There's so much iteration. I think this is where a lot of uh, plugins tend to fall off is they'll just fix the one solution without iterating and mm -hmm. coming up with, even better ways to process the audio. And so, um, I mean, we go through many rounds of just iterating and iterating. The UI had looked totally different a year ago. Um, it was like a completely different concept almost. And then we changed <laughs> yeah. it. We when you showed it. it to me, when you showed it to me in October of 2023, oh, yeah. I was like, I went from, okay, that's cool. Right. Like that's cool. And then fast forward, you know, six months, I was like, okay, like now, now I see what yeah. you're talking about. It takes yeah. a long time. Yeah. To get right. Um, yeah. especially with the interaction, like there are certain things you just can't predict about the way people are going to use it mm -hmm. and the way like certain things uh, aren't confusing to you just because you're so comfortable with it. And it's, I find this too, when I'm writing music you've just heard it too many times you've just seen it too many times you're like numb to it um and it, it's hard to understand like how people are really perceiving it and so that's the, the beta testing and the feedback is so important we had so many beta testers um mm -hmm. come in and try it and we would change something and and fix it and redo it and uh, I, I guess that's just what it takes. You really, and, and pe people do this with their music too. Like you'll go through 10 versions until you feel like you're comfortable with it. But we take the same approach to plugins. I mean, yeah. that's smart, especially for developers nowadays. It almost feels like the cards are in a way stacked against you because if mm. you have a plugin and you don't test it and then you put it out and people are all excited if there's like some promo on and then they get their hands on it and like something unfortunately breaks. I mean, that happens in software, but a lot of people aren't very forgiving and you get one first impression and then people write everything off for, forever. So it's like, if I was totally. a developer, I'd be really scared of that. So I'd probably put a lot of time into beta testing and making sure everything's cool before totally. you finally start releasing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And we were, our, this was even riskier than like a normal plugin because the UI tech stack that we're using, the framework, is all brand new. Like we started from oh, scratch. Oh, whoa. Um, yeah. Wow. Like uh, we, we use this really amazing. Um, uh, functional audio programming language called Elementary, uh, which you all should check out. It's kind of like the new frontier of how DSP should be written for web technology. It's very, very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. 
And many people don't really know this. It's like a fun fact about Beam. It actually works on your web browser. Uh, it's no like way. It's, a no web, way. it's a web plugin, and this is, uh, without revealing too much, like a little bit of our um, long-term goal. Uh, we really, really believe in the future of web audio and web technology. Yeah. Um, so Beam, as it stands, will work in your DAW, and with very little work, will also work in your uh Chrome tab, so it's it's kind of an interesting <laughs> thing to yeah. And not it's not something that we've marketed because no one really right. cares. You can't actually use it. In no, your I don't care. Tab. That's actually very fascinating. <laughs> um, but it's just like a little fun fact behind the scenes of like w- where we're taking our tech and uh, it, new frameworks like that come with a lot of headaches because it's it's just it's it's like a totally new world that you're dealing with. Um, and it's been very rigor- rigorously tested, but uh, not on the scale of like a totally new plugin where you you finally have like thousands of people getting their hands dirty with it. And um, that's when you start to see like all of the little bits and pieces come out where you need to patch things. And and we've we've done our best to really keep things as clean as possible. But like I think we're the first to use this framework with. Uh, like a an interface that uses this interactive like WebGL technology, so mm-hmm. it's there were naturally like a lot of hiccups in the beta testing process where it's like oh well this has never really existed in a DAW before, we don't know if it's going to work on like this ancient twenty or two thousand eight Windows machine like you know it's it's tricky for mm-hmm. sure. It's cool wow. to know what's behind the plugins, right? Some some of the developers just go strictly with C. Some go with C plus plus, and they do their own thing with their own frameworks. Some go with Juice, and they just kind of like this is my home. So it's like it's interesting how people approach that differently. Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, and they all work. It really just depends on what, like, what your end goal is with the plugin. And at the end of the day, it, it just needs to work in in a DAW. Like, people need to be able to use it in a DAW. But um, we're very excited by the idea of having it also work on the web eventually to be able to have people interact with things maybe before they even buy them to be able to like scroll through a product page and be able to um, play with something here it just on the product page before you even purchase it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there. That would be even one use case of it. I've actually come across DAWs where you can have, they're like collaborative DAWs where you, mm-hmm. they're connected through the internet where you can have two people working on the same project at the same time. Totally. But like, when <laughs> yeah, you, got when, as soon as you control. said that, as soon as you said that Beam will run in a web browser, my mind just exploded. I was like, wait a minute. So what if we were all reaching this point where we're interconnected and we're connecting our tools together and then we're all coming together in a collaborative space that doesn't just necessarily exactly. mean a DAW. Like, what even is a DAW? You know what I'm saying? Like, what right. even is a DAW? Uh, an environment, <laughs> right? The, the plugins are, you can freely use them in our, in our web browser, quote unquote. And, you know, that kind of thing. Like, it's just fascinating to me um, that you guys yeah. went there. I mean, BandLab has done a really good job at this. I don't know if you all have seen BandLab. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so crazy. I, I don't know why, like, music producers haven't heard of it because they have 100 million users, apparently. Mm-hmm. It's this. It's a web doll. It's kind of exactly what you just described. Yeah. Um, I'm, like, pulling up the page right now. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's, it's, so, it's so popular. Um, it has a hundred million users, apparently, mm-hmm. according to them. And, uh, it's, it's like this global web doll that everyone has been using for years now. But I think it, the, the difference is like, it's not anywhere near as powerful as a desktop right. application. It just can't sure. be quite yet. So it's really more for hobbyists or, or people who are just getting into music. And I think that's why a lot of us who have been doing this for a long time have never touched it or heard of it. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's pretty encouraging to think that there are that many people interested in right. music production or sound design or whatever. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying. Like, hopefully the, the new applications of it aren't just going to be for, you know, fun and game little things. Like, it's actually going to be yeah. tools that you can actually use to make music that you can record and you know, this is my record, you know, that kind of thing. Like I actually <laughs> totally. use this tool to make a, a piece of music that I'm proud of and I can actually market and sell. Totally. And I yeah. think you can have the best of both worlds where mm-hmm. it's like there, you have some gamification of the interface. Sure. Uh, but it's a serious tool. 
that you it's can a serious use. Tool. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I do, I do wow. have a question. Um, this and this might I don't know if anyone's asked you this before, but so we know that Steinberg's VSD has been around for God knows how long, right? We've gone mm-hmm. through the first two, three, and then you know different formats come out: AU, AAX, so far, and then Clap comes out. And yeah. it's kind of interesting because you have Yuhi and Bitwig spearheading this new format, which is pretty mind blowing once you kind of take a look under the hood and like how it works and all that. Mm-hmm. So, do you think in the future the VST format's going to slowly start to fade away as people maybe adopt Clap or something like that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, this might be the limit of my technical prowess. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me think. Uh, I I think VST three is going to be around for a long time. Um, I think it's so well supported by Juice and Steinberg has no reason to let it die. It, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, it's, it takes so long for these new plugin formats to get adopted because like Be- Beam isn't available in Clap yet because we just, th- there's so much more testing we would need to do to guarantee that it's going to work properly. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's the issue. I think I think we're trying to balance like how many new things we're doing at once. Cause we can't right. use like a new web audio framework and a new type of interface framework and clap all together. It's just um, too many things can, can go wrong with that. Um, yeah. But clap seems amazing. Uh, hats off to Yui and, and Bitwig. I, I think we'll probably see more of these formats start to creep in as we look at new spaces like web or uh, VR, whatever it is, um, they'll they'll kind of require new formats for this. Like I don't think, well, they do have like an iPad format, the AUV3 or something. I think works for mm-hmm. iPad, but yeah, it's an interesting question. I think over time we'll need new formats for the new types of channels and media that we're using for music production. Sure. Yeah. Well, look how long MIDI 1.0 lasted. I mean, right. was, <laughs> yeah, like 30 years, 40 years. That's true. Years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Casey, you're somebody who I could just talk to all day, man. I mean, honestly, oh, thank like, you. Thank yeah, you. You're, you're, such a, you're such a personal guy and you have a lot of knowledge. And I think a lot of, you know, our, our listeners and watchers um, have gotten a lot out of this conversation. So what would be, you know, what are your, what are your, Call offs. Like, what do you do? You have anybody you want to thank, or anything you you want to tell our viewers and listeners? Oh wow, yeah, yeah. People I want to thank. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, I have to thank my co-founders. Yeah, and uh, I have two co-founders, Max and Brian, who have been with me since we started in 2019, Mm -hmm. and then also my best friend Brandon. uh, He's a Pixar engineer, and he actually designed all of our interface components oh, for wow. beam right. and cube he's so smart like he's mm-hmm. like the the brains behind the entire look of our brand and our products he's he's brilliant um yeah very grateful for all those people and for our developers like they're mm-hmm. yeah I, I it it i never wanted to seem like this was my thing it took a very large team of people to get this across the finish line. And most of the ideas were not mine. They were from other mm-hmm. people. So yeah. it's, yeah, it, it's, it's special to see something come together with that, like such a large team of people all working towards one goal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I hope people are enjoying it. It's, it's, been really, it's been really fun to launch it. All right. Well, um, lunacy.audio um, is the, the website. Um, are you? Did you guys change the name of the company? Is it just Lunacy now? There's no we audio. We're just attached? Lunacy, which I think just is way Lunacy. cooler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we're Lunacy Inc. Now. Uh, it, it's been changing your name is tough. Not that we like changed it. We just removed the audio. But <laughs> right, right. Um, the number of like places we've had to email, like, can you please update our logo, is a yeah. lot. It takes a long. <laughs> it's like it's basically like phasing out VST3. It's just going to take a long time. <laughs> yeah, a I love very that. long time. <laughs> I might just follow your lead and just be like, I'm just John now. There's no yeah, audio. There, just you John. Go. That's yeah, it. there you That's go. It. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> That's pretty I'm just sick. myself. I like that. Oh my gosh. Like well, that. listen, we look forward to having you speaking with you again, having you on the show, maybe sometime in the future. Um, For you sure. Know, we'll have more to talk about. It's We'd exciting. Regardless, you know, the future looks really bright. Thank you guys. It's been a yeah. pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for talking with us and for everybody out there. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, please subscribe to the Signs of Life and John Audio channels on YouTube. 
The link for our channels is down below in the description and in the show notes. For the video version of this show, please subscribe to the Harmonic Horizons YouTube channel to keep up with all the latest episodes. For bonus content, including additional podcast material, head over to the Signs of Life Patreon page. Paid members get access to Beyond the Horizon, our new series of extended conversations with our guests, as well as several other benefits such as early access to all of his videos, exclusive ambient tutorials, over 100 preset packs for various synthesizers, one-on-one -on -one coaching for ambient and electronic music, and tons more. If you'd like to support John Audio and the work he does, head over to his YouTube channel and subscribe. You can also check out his Gumroad page for a selection of free and paid preset packs. Finally, he has a Patreon page where subscribers get access to additional content, such as exclusive music, presets for various synths, such as Pigments and Diva, specialized courses, and more. Harmonic Horizons is hosted on Buzzsprout and is now available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast directories. If you'd like to reach out to us or would like to be a guest on the show, you can contact us at harmonichorizonspodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next one.